We don't always get to see what goes on in other parts of the country. So um, Jim gave us a pretty good idea of his vision and where he sees PCA going. So the neat thing about that was he was explaining how PCA has now expanded. Hi, Raul. How are you? Hi. I'll mute in a second. Thanks. I'm, I'm no having trouble with my uh, wife. Okay. No problem. Um, we have 13 chapters right now of Positive Coaching Alliance across the country. And the newest chapter is in Portland, Oregon, which will be opening any day now. Um, Los Angeles is one of the most recent, and Hawaii. And the goal, uh, Jim's vision and his goal is by 2020 to have 26 chapters across the country. And that's really, that's, that's an aggressive goal, and that's really exciting. And they actually already have the cities mapped out uh, where they'd like to open a local chapter. Uh, what impressed me the most was the, the fundraising that they'd like to do in order to open these Chapter 20 offices. The fundraising goal is $20 million to raise by 2020. And when most of us hear that number, I'm like, oh my gosh, how can PCA raise $20 million that quickly? Um, but it's really cool to see the team of people that are raising that amount of money um, to, to fund these chapters and, and keep our movement going. Now, somebody, Ruben actually explained, uh, clarified on the call earlier today that the $20 million is not just to open the local chapters, that it costs about $400,000 to fund each local chapter and seed funding to get the chapter started. And Positive Coaching Alliance National, um, the National Board actually funds that for three years, which I actually didn't know that, Ruben, until you explained that this morning. I didn't realize that was the case. And then after that, the local chapter is then responsible to keep that momentum going. Am I correct? Am I saying that correctly? Um, pretty, pretty, pretty <laughs> accurate. Pretty accurate, yeah. Um, you, you know, um, to, to start a new chapter under our current expansion model, a local community commits approximately $400,000 over a three-year period. That amount is, is matched in some way. I don't, I don't think it's a full dollar-for-dollar dollar match, but then the, the, the PCA national office does some matching of those committed funds for the first three years. And that's what gets the chapter up and running. Uh, it allows us to hire an executive director, a partnership manager, and start an operation. And the goal is that by year four, the local chapter now is self-sufficient and not relying on the national office for any kind of subsidy or additional funding. That they are now, through their own local fundraising and their own local workshops, um, uh, are now self-sufficient financially. That's, mm -hmm. that's the model. That's the goal. All right. Thank you. For clarifying that. So it's just good for us to see as trainers we don't always get involved with all the business ventures. So it was really neat to see the vision and, and where we're going because a lot of times at workshops people ask how big are you and are you expanding and I've got a friend that lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Are you heading over there anytime soon? So it's uh, I think it's just good for us to keep keep sharp on some of the expansion that the company is um, looking to do. Uh, one of the next speakers that was really great, her name is Dr. Mary Fry, and she is from the University of Kansas. And she was our guest speaker. She spent the entire weekend with all the trainers. And her topic was creating a caring climate. She has spent a lot of time and research on creating this caring environment, and not necessarily in sports, but she cited some of the research that she's done and some of the work that she's done. With uh, She specifically brought up a, a Little League baseball team that she had been working with and really trying to change the culture on the baseball team. And she had them develop a pact between the coaches and the teammates and the players' behavior. And the cool thing is, is when you see someone like an outside speaker come in and the messages are the same, that this caring environment, she used some of our lingo, the filling the emotional tanks, the coaches really rewarding effort over results does have a better result in the, in the long run on the whole program as a whole, but also on the performance of the athletes. So it was just neat. She had a lot of quotes from coaches that have um, been exposed to her research and said, you know, this is kind of tough for me to do. This is a very, this is a hard environment for me. And, and they've seen major changes happen. So it's really, it's really neat. It, she was great. She was there all weekend and we were able to share a lot of ideas with her. So it's always fun to have somebody from the outside come in. Now the next session that was one of my favorites, we called it Trainers in Action. And this was a session where we spent four and a half hours on Friday afternoon and each trainer was put into eight, one of eight different small groups. And it was really like rapid fire training. We got to watch about five to six trainers in each group present for 10 minutes on any topic in any workshop that they want to. And then each person was given five minutes of feedback. And it was just a great way for us to be able to see so many different trainers. And, and I, I tried to mix them up by um, experience level and also by location. So it was people that you don't get to see very often. 
um, get to shine and get to see what they do well. Some trainers brought up some questions that they had or some stories they want to try and they weren't sure how it would go over. Um, so that was a really great opportunity to be able to watch so many different trainers and some of these trainers have been doing this for over 10 years and they really don't get a chance to get feedback that often. So I put a little you know, note in the back of my head that somehow we have to work this in because we all get better through feedback and I know I got better just from watching people. So that was really, that was really a highlight of the week. Um, another one was a workshop interactivity clinic that um, has another exciting result. Tom Heimsoff, who is a veteran trainer out in the Bay Area, he ran a session where all of us got together and uh, all the trainers and, and staff and whoever was there and he put up a, a poster, he put up a lot of posters actually, but a poster on each wall um, that represented each workshop that we do from the coaches, the parents, the athletes, the leadership workshops and then each, each group got to brainstorm on how to make that workshop the most interactive and engaging and some cool ideas in order to illustrate different principles and points in that workshop. So we got to go to one work, one poster that had double gold coach one and then we got to go to another poster that had parents and another poster that had athletes and by the end we had a list of you know about 20 to 25 different ideas for each workshop things that most of us you know either take for granted because we do it all the time or we've never even thought of doing um, and then we kind of narrowed it down to let's just share one or two of the best ideas that you see on that poster and we run around and shared them with the group so the cool thing about that is that uh, one of our trainers put together a Google Drive, a Google document that's going to have all of those ideas and they're just, I think it's just going to be called workshop interactivity ideas. So that when you become trainers, if you're trying to think of a way to cleverly illustrate a point or engage the audience a little bit better, you're going to have that document to be able to pull from that has some very cool ideas. So that was a, that was a really neat session. Um, then we did some demonstrations of some new workshops. Um, some of the workshops are are, we're adding on are we, what we call deep dive. So instead of just the coaches, the parents, and the athletes, we're now getting into um, a deep dive into each of the principles. So one of the first deep dive workshops is called positive motivation. And that's um, really getting deeper into the idea of filling the emotional tanks. So Ruben and I demonstrated that new workshop for people. And then there's another workshop that um, Ruben was able to certify a few people in called making teammates better. It's positive initiation and making teammates better for the athletes. So that's exciting too. That's a new workshop that's rolling out in August. Um, and then we got to do a, a workshop in the evening on common disasters. What are some things that happen in workshops that come up that um, you might not expect? Um, getting stuck in traffic and being late for a workshop or showing up and not having the room ready or you know belligerent coaches that sit in the front of the room. or It was just really interesting to hear some of the catastrophes that trainers have made into wonderful learning opportunities and how they've overcome them and how would you handle it. So that was great for some of our new trainers too to hear, even the old trainers, to hear some of that. Um, other than that, the only other thing that I did want to add, um, Rachel Taggett's actually got to come out. She's from Arizona and she's in the course. She got to come out for the Trainer Institute, sort of a last minute addition because the Phoenix office uh, really needs her to be certified as soon as possible. So she got to come out and in her session after she presented, she asked the trainers in the room, she said, just because I'm new and I'm not even certified yet, and I'm just going through the course right now, if you had one piece of advice for me, something that you wish you had known, or, or some advice you have for all of the new trainers starting out, what would it be? And um, the advice that she got, she said, I got a few different things, but the advice that she got overwhelming with us this afternoon on the, on the 12 o'clock, it meant a lot to her, because especially when you're watching so many trainers over the course of four to five days, and you want to emulate, and you want to do what they do, and take their ideas. It was really nice to hear. You know, being genuine is really the most important thing. So, um, Ruben, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah. About Trainer yeah, Institute. Um, yeah. Uh, br briefly, a couple things, Kelly. Okay. First go ahead. Of all, just towards the end there, when you were talk talking about Rachel and the question she asked of other trainers, of yep. veteran trainers, uh, at least on my screen, you froze, and some of the words were missing. But I know what you oh, said. In the, but I know what you said in this morning's call, which was that Rachel, that one of the best pieces of advice she received was just be yourself as a trainer. Is that is that yep. what you said? Yeah. It and, is. Yeah. Um, Sorry. And, and that's that not 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 to not to no. get into you know, am I as dynamic and energetic as Kelly, and how, you know, how am I going to be like Kelly, or how am I going to be like like Raul, or or whatever? Um, and and that's absolutely uh, we we believe that and. The balance that we hope all trainers will, will bring, be, besides being yourself and um, 
putting your own personal touch on workshops is that there, there is enough consistency from Kelly's workshop to my workshop to Ruth's to Alonzo's workshop. Um, you know, for example, out of Double Goal Coach One, they leave. They know what a Double Goal Coach is. They know what the three principles are. They know what a mistake ritual is, a self-control routine. They know what the power mm -hmm. of Double Goal Coaching, the book, is about and how it can help them coach. You know, so there's some, there's going to be lots of consistency as we are ourselves as trainers and bring our own personality and touch to workshops. Um, Kelly, just lastly, um, mm -hmm. to summarize Trainer Institute, Kelly gave you a nice overview. To summarize it, what we try to do in that event is three, three things, basically. One is we want it to be a, a, an opportunity for connection for our trainers. And Kelly touched upon this. You know, when you're out in Minnesota, when you're out in Mexico City, wherever you are, uh, you know, you're removed and, and you're remote from the organization and sometimes it's a challenge to stay connected to to the organization and the mission and so the the event is meant to to, to provide that opportunity for connection secondly it's meant uh, as an opportunity for everybody to work to make each other better as trainers so and, and I, I feel very confident that uh, all 50 trainers that attended feel that they left um, stronger and better equipped to help transform you sports. And then the third, the th our third goal in Trainer Institute is for it to be a reward for, for all our hard work and a job well done. We want it to be fun, we want it to be enjoyable, and um, so, so we, uh, although we work the trainers very hard over the course of the, the three and a half days, um, we want it to be a fun, enjoyable time as well. And, and, and Kelly and I feel very good about uh, having accomplished those three goals uh, this past weekend. Thanks, Ruben. Absolutely. Um, do you guys have any more any questions about Trainer Institute for Ruben or myself or anybody else about what you know anything that happened before we move on? Jump in if you do. All right. Okay, well then I'm gonna get uh, we're gonna get started with um, it's the last time because I do get myself frozen freezing a little bit. So let me know if you do miss anything because um, to me I can't I can't tell if I'm I can hear myself so I can't tell if I'm being heard. Um, but this is the last principle that we talk about and um, it is the end of the workshop. So by this point in the workshop, you've probably been going for a good you know maybe a little bit less than an hour. So this is a, a principle that has a lot of information in it. It's really valuable information. It's good information. But I want to make sure that you stay as engaged for this as you did in the beginning. So I'm going to share with you a few different ways that trainers have presented this portion of the workshop. Um, I'm going to go through each of it first and just talk a little bit about each, each one of the roots of honoring the game. And I'll use you as sort of an example audience. But then I'll go through and, and um, I have some, a couple other ideas that I'd like to share with you, if that's OK. So what I want to do first of all, we just ended up with the um, filling the emotional tank toolkit. So this is the slide that comes up right before. We've talked about the magic ratio. You've had them in the book, looking at page 32 to explain a little bit about what the magic ratio is and how to use that. So they're just coming off of that. And then the next slide just booms right to this. So there's not really a title slide. So I think transitions are really important from one to the next. So what I would, what I usually do is to end up this. Um, this emotional tank toolkit, we've just kind of talked about the five to one ratio and how important it is to get the best performance out of the athlete so that they're coachable, so that they're better able to deal with adversity. Now we're going to get into our last principle that we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to use uh, an example, a real life example that happened in 2008 to illustrate this principle. Does this picture look familiar to any of you? Are any of you familiar with this story? Yes, a lot of you are. Okay. Well, this is a, this is a great example of what we call honoring the game. And I always say a picture is worth a thousand words, so a video must be worth about a million. So let me show you, let me show you a clip um, of what happened if you're not familiar with this story, and then we'll talk about it. And then I show the video. In a small town in the middle of Washington State, on a field inside a chain link fence, in a game fewer than a hundred people saw. A home run memorable, not for the distance it traveled with the game it decided for the meaning it carried. 
As a senior, this was Sarah Tukolsky's last chance to win a championship. She'd never hit a home run before, not in college, not in her life. The top of the second inning with two runners on, on the second pitch, that changed. So here's what happened. Sarah hit a home run, but as she turned, as she rounded first base, she tore her ACL and could not go any further. The umpire said that her teammates could not assist her, and if she were replaced by a pinch runner, Sarah's homer would become a single. So let's find out what they did. That's when Central Washington's Mallory Holtman, a player with more home runs than any other in conference history, a player for the opposing team, spoke up. I went to the home plate umpire and asked if we could pick up the carrier. And he looked at me a little strange. And she says, you, you hit the ball of the, the fence, you deserve it. For that reason only, because she deserved it, Holtman and Wallace began to carry the injured to Kalski stopping to touch her left foot on each base as the three made their way around the diamond. That's the first time I've seen it for number eight, Sarah Tukolsky. All right, and that's the video. Just trainer to trainer to let you know, um, as you saw, that video stops and the words come up on the screen. Um, if you read them slowly, they're, they're actually, they actually come up pretty slowly. One of the first, times, first couple times I did it, I read them so quickly, and then there was just this delay, <laughs> this pause, and you weren't sure what to say. So you can practice actually reading those words on the screen, because there's sometimes people might not be able to see them from where they are. But I also think this is a very important part to just pause for a minute, because even people that are familiar with this story, they might, have not, they might not have seen uh, that version of it. So I usually just pause on the black screen for a minute before I continue. And I just, I just think about, I, I just ask the question to the group. Let's just say that you were the coaches watching that happen. You were Liz Wallace and Mallory Holtman's coach. What would be going through your mind right now, right after you saw that happen? And I would ask them to turn, if, you know, if it's this part in the workshop, I would ask them possibly to turn to somebody. Turn to somebody next to you and just, just say the first phrase that would pop into your mind. So instead of you guys turning and, and talking, would any of you like to share kind of a thought going through your mind as if you were their coach? Somebody can just unmute and share with me. I would just think that's the coolest thing ever. Mm -hmm. I would be really proud of them. Mm -hmm. and probably a lot of times they usually surprise surprise you with their heart and usually that's you know that's what's the most moving is you know it came from them and not from what you did. It's it's out of their own hearts. Right. The coach wasn't yelling, pick her up, pick her up. <laughs> they did that on their own. Good. So you'd be excited. You'd be proud. What else? Any other thoughts? What about her teammates? What do you think was going through her teammates' head at the time? What do you think, Raul? Put yourself back in your college days. What do you think you'd think if you were a teammate at the time? I don't see that you're muted, but I can't hear you. No, I can't hear you. Sorry. All right, someone else. <laughs> Lindsay, how about you? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I guess as a teammate, I would probably think, wow, that's like a really legit thing to do. But mm -hmm. also, it seems kind of obvious, but I feel like no one would think about it. Everyone would be just, just be standing there looking at each other. So to have someone really step up and think clearly and do the right thing is impressive. And also, everyone's probably like, wow, we should have all thought of that. Yeah, I'm sure that was a lot of them going, oh, yeah, why didn't I think of that? Um, one of the Rachel's even this afternoon said, you know, as a teammate, sort of, I would sit there and go, what are they doing? Like, that just, you know, sometimes when somebody gets hurt, it, it's, you, you feel bad for them, and it's a bummer, but that's part of the game, you know? Sorry, home run didn't work. 
So she was actually, and I've had people comment that at workshops and go, I was, if I was a teammate, I'd be like, yo, wait, what are you doing? This is crazy. You know, don't count the point. Um, one of the neat things about this story is that afterwards, they did have a chance to reflect on what happened. And I think at the moment, obviously people were cheering. They were very proud and they were excited for the really regal act of sportsmanship. But the girls said, you know, some of their teammates were like, hey, that was great, but, you know, it kind of lost the game for us. It was kind of a bummer. When they interviewed the coaches later, the coaches said, you know what, I really wasn't surprised um, because I knew these two girls and I knew the kind of hearts that they had and it didn't really surprise me. And that hit me when I heard that because I thought, wow, the teams that I coach, would I be shocked if my players did something like that? Or would I say, you know what, that's the kind of culture I have. I would hope that every single girl on my team would do that or every player on any team. So this really illustrates well the last principle we call honoring the game. Now I know all of you probably as youth athletes had a list of do's and don'ts that your coach said this is how to be a good sport. I know the word sportsmanship is a very overused word and I remember my coach always giving me a list of okay this is what you should not do in a game. What were some of those should nots that you should do in being a good sport athlete? What were you not supposed to do as a kid? Can you remember any of them? And I would just have the audience just call out a few. Don't do what? Argue with the refs. Don't argue with the refs. Thanks, Ruben. Mm -hmm. What else? Don't argue with your coach. Yeah, don't argue with your coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, be respectful. about you. Uh, I was always re respect uh, the other players after the game when we go through the handshakes. You know, yeah. look them in the square in the eye and give them a high five. Don't slap it. You know, mm -hmm. tell them good game no matter which way it went. Yeah, good, 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 good. Well, one of the neat things that we have done is um, take sportsmanship to the next level because a lot of times you hear what don't do. Don't pick on the refs. Don't yell at your teammates. Don't have a long face. Um, don't argue. All of these things are a lot of lists of don'ts. Well, what we've done is taken this principle and we've turned it into a list of do's. It's a really great guideline for how to honor the game, honor the roots of competition. And the roots of competition go far beyond just the game at that moment. We break it down into five different areas that we really want to create a culture of utmost respect for all of these areas. And you might have some areas on your team that, yeah, my team does a really great job at respecting officials. We don't have any problem with that. But the kids are on each other's backs all the time. So at PCA, we talk about the roots of honoring the game. And we break it down into five, five different things. Now, the first area are the rules of the game. Now, who can tell me why do games have rules? This is a pretty obvious question. Why do we have rules of a game in the first place? As I see so, Raul. So, so that we know who wins and loses. <laughs> so you know who wins and loses. Exactly. Okay, so it keeps some structure and fairness. All right, what else? Why else do we have rules? Lack of chaos. Yeah, lack of chaos. It keeps things organized. So we all know the rules. We teach the rules to our players. Have any of you, hands up, if you've ever seen a rule broken in a game that a player has gotten away with? Absolutely. Can you think of an example in your sport of a rule that is broken frequently, that it's almost socially acceptable? If nobody sees it, it's okay. You got away with it. And I know there's different examples in different sports. Can you think of one that kind of is taken advantage of a little bit? Fouling in basketball. Yeah, definitely. Fouling in basketball. Ref didn't see my elbow go up or neck, so I got away with it. What else? I played field hockey and there were kick we were kicking the ball all over the field and that was supposed to be a foul. It was supposed to stop every time a ball was kicked. That happened a lot without, without ref seeing it. So what I want you to think of is not only the written rule but also the spirit of the rule. And the way that we respect the rules as coaches in a team can really set the tone for the whole team. Um, and one of the debates that I like to have too, at, this is just trainer to trainer if you have some time, is the idea of, of calling every foul at practice. Um, not that there's necessarily a black and white rule on it, but it's also really important because a lot of coaches don't think about the problem when they, if they run a scrimmage and they don't call every foul, what does that encourage the players to do in a game? Um, setting up game type situations is a great thing to do in practice, but make sure you treat it as if it were a game situation. Sometimes they say, well, I only have 10 minutes to scrimmage at the end of practice. If I called every single foul, they would just, it would lose the continuity, which I get. 
But maybe there's, I've had coaches that have said, you know, sometimes I just throw up a flag and say, keep playing, play on, play on, play on, just so they're aware of fouls. So just between you and I, it's been a neat kind of a debate to have about rules. All right, the second O is opponents. And a worthy opponent, we believe at PCA, a worthy opponent is a gift. And to illustrate this, I think a lot of you can probably remember back to a time when you've gone into a game or a contest or a competition, and you as a coach have felt like, you know what? This is going to be a great game. We are going to do really well. Last time we played this team, we crashed, we crushed them. And so I'm feeling really good about how, how we're going to do going into this game. And you get out there, and you watch your players, and they are playing the sloppiest game you've ever seen. Their skill level has actually come down to the level of the opponent. Anybody, anybody with me here? Anybody see that happen? Yes. Conversely, what else can happen? That's a really great thing. I've gone into games and thought, we're going to get crushed. <laughs> this team is so strong. They have beaten us twice now, and I can't believe we have to play them again. And all of a sudden, the kids on my team are on fire. They are all over the place. They are fired up. They're excited. And the skill level goes up. I once heard somebody say, playing a game of tug of war without an opponent on the other end doesn't make much sense. So think about it as, if you don't have an opponent, you don't have a game. And we like to say, if you're treating opponents with respect, we want you to be a fierce competitor out there. But we also want you to be friendly. So fierce and friendly is a good, a good way to remember it. If you knock someone down in a, in a difficult, aggressive play in the game, that's fine. Just make sure you turn around and help them up later and ask them how they're doing. One of the things I did for my team, I noticed that my, my little six-year-olds, when I started coaching six-year-old soccer, all right, go ahead, Raul. When I was coaching six-year-old soccer, um, I noticed the kids at the end of the game would get so fired up. They were so excited. And I also learned that it was because it was snack time at the end of the game. But I one time asked my daughter, what is your favorite part of the game? And she said, Mom, it's the goo game. And I said, what's the goo game? And she said, you know at the end of the game where everyone stands in a line and goes, goo game, goo game, goo game, goo game, goo game, and high fives everyone. And that got them so fired up and excited. So from that moment on, I asked the other team every time, I said, can we do the handshake line before the game starts? And they look at me kind of like, well, yeah, I'll go ahead. But it gets the kids excited. It gets them fired up. They're high-fiving their opponents. A lot of times they're seeing their friends that they see in school all the time. And it just really sets the tone that the opponents that we're playing against are really meant to make the game more fun, not that they're your enemies. It's not a war zone out there. So I thought that was a really neat idea. Officials is the next one. Now, respecting officials. Some of us say, yeah, I do a great job with this. Others, we've seen a little bit of problems. Who do you think um, are the most, who, who's most guilty of disrespecting officials, would you say? How many of you would, I'm going to give you a choice, coaches, parents, or athletes? How many of you would say coaches? How many of you would say parents? How many of you would say athletes? Okay, when I ask this question, I get three hands up all the time. Everybody has kind of an even vote on coaches, parents, and athletes. Let me ask you this question. Who do you think is the most important person to respect officials? Coaches, parents, or athletes? Okay, someone that said coaches. Why do you say coaches? I think it might be the mood I'm in because it's really important that, that the kids respect the, the officials, but I think you lead by example. So mm -hmm. if they see it and they hear it, then they, sh you know, then a lot of times it's easier to do. I mean, it actually it happened to us this last game. Mm -hmm. and so, um, but at the same time, you know, I, I don't know. I think those two are almost equally important. But mm -hmm. I, I, I guess as coaches, I don't know. It just, <laughs> it, it just, it just be a game time decision for me. Yep. Somebody that said athletes or parents. Let me hear why you said athletes or parents. I said athletes, and I think, one, they have to start practicing the behavior that you want them to model, so they mm -hmm. have to be respectful of the officials, and I think from a strategy standpoint, if they're complaining and just having bad attitudes, you're not going to get any calls, and you're going to have a, like uphill battle with the refs. Yeah, I agree. That's a good point, too. I have, Raul, I saw your point, too. You set the example. One of the things that I like to stress to coaches is that you do set the example, and all of these areas are teachable moments that you can have. How can you set it up to teach your players to respect officials? Besides just saying, okay, team, we have to always respect the official. Whatever official's call is made, that's the one we stick with. That's much easier said than done. So let's set up some scenarios in practice where we purposely make a bad call. Or let's put an official shirt on a player and let that player referee the game for a little while and see how difficult it is to handle the referees and the officials. 
I have a, we have a, a trainer that I just met this weekend who shared a story of his son who began officiating. And he said, I think I was the only dad at the game who came to watch the official. Everybody else was out there to see the parents and the kids, and he was there to cheer on the official. And he said, you know what I learned about my son? I learned that my son was blind. I learned that my son was stupid. I learned that he was an idiot, and I learned that he had some four-letter words before his name that I know my wife and I didn't give him. And he was shocked to see the disrespect for his son out there, just blatant disrespect all over the place. And his son, in the car later, he said, oh, how was the game? And his son said, you know what, Dad? All of those coaches and parents that were yelling at me, whatever team they were on, I made sure they got the worst call called against them next time. If it was kind of a questionable call, I made sure I gave them the call. So what are they thinking? Why would they be so hard on me? And that's something that across the board officials tell you all the time. The redder the face, the redder the flag. That's what I always heard. So keep yourself calm. It will do you, it will do your team justice. It will be better for you in the end. The next one is teammates. This is one that we push really hard. Respecting teammates on the field is something that coaches have control over most of the time. But the respect of the teammates off the field is sometimes what goes a little bit, uh, is a little bit foggy. It's a little bit of a gray area. How important is it to have that team unity? How important is it to have that team bonding? I bet if I asked each one of you to give me the score of five games that you played in high school against five teams. I don't think there's very many of you that could give me the exact outcome of five games if I look back at your schedule. But if I asked you five teammates that made an impression on you, I bet all of you could rattle them off very quickly. And this is something that I, you could do at a workshop. You could see, turn to somebody next to you and name five teammates that had an impression on you. It's the teammates, it's the bond that you have with them. It's the way they push you. It's the way they encourage you. It's the way they inspire you. It's the way they blow by you in practice and get you so fired up that you don't want them to do it again. That's what teammates are for. So as coaches, it's our job to build that type of team unity together. At this point, what I'd like you to do, and I might have coaches get in groups at this point and ask them, what are some things you do to really bring that bond of your teammates together? What are some ideas that sometimes have nothing to do with your sport that you do as sort of a team unity event? And so I would have them maybe get in a group of three or get in a group of four and share for a minute how they would do this. So do you guys have an example of something that you've seen done or something that you like to do? I just uh, usually once in the season the, with the rec team, we'll go uh, together and watch one of the high schools play uh, a game. And it's kind of different atmosphere and we're doing things together. So the girls kind of get around, they start talking and giggling and, and stuff like that. And so we've always had really good time. And I've a lot of times I've known some of the high school players on the floor and we'll go down after the game and meet the girls and mm -hmm. they get all excited and stuff like that. So, Yeah, absolutely. Great example, George. So I would let a couple people share their examples of ways that you can, you can really respect teammates on the field and off the field. And I also mention at this point that when we get into the high school workshops, we really do talk a lot about hazing and the differences between hazing and bullying and how that can really be detrimental to a team. And if you want to, a lot of people have the argument that hazing is just initiation, it's just tradition, it's something we've always done. And we give coaches some other options besides the really derogatory negative ways of hazing and getting kids initiated into the team. There's a whole, there's a whole workshop now um, called Positive Initiation on how to build team unity. The really interesting story that I heard this weekend um, that I want to share too is that um, Danielle Slayton is one of our trainers and she's out in Chicago. And she actually played on the U.S. team. She played at the Olympics in Sydney for soccer. And she talked about how when she was in high school, her idea of a solid team was a, a totally different experience than she had at the Olympic level. She had a very win-at-all-cost coach in high school. She also had teammates that really truly did believe that freshmen were the low men on the totem pole and the seniors ran the show and you had to earn your way up the ladder in order to be respected as a player. So she assumed when she made the U.S. team that this was going to be even more intense than it was then. And she was shocked. She said the first week of practice at the, at the Olympic camp or the national team camp, she was welcomed with open arms. She said she, at the, at the first overnight they had, she was rooming in a hotel with Julie Foudy, who had already been on the team for about 15 years. She said Julie Foudy was a poster on my wall when I was five years old, and she was the person that they put me with in my hotel room. It was nothing but tank filling and team bonding, and she just said it was a great, great experience, and they were so supportive of one another. And that was the highest level of play. So that really impressed me. Not all of us as trainers can show a picture of Julie Foudy and say, yeah, I got to room with her during the national team camp when I started. But it's, again, I, I, I thought it was a neat story to share. Um, and then the last one we talk about is self. Respecting the players, the players respecting themselves, and 
also the coach respecting themselves. We've already talked about your behavior as a coach and how much of a model that it is. So I'm sure there's a lot of times during the game where you have to make a choice as a coach on how to react. Respect of yourself is what are you doing? Even if society and everyone else and the fans and the parents are encouraging you to do the opposite, are you doing the right thing? Character is what you do when nobody's watching. So do you have that type of character and are you instilling that and emphasizing that with your athletes? So this is the roots of honoring the game. Um, let me just stop there for one second because this was a lot of words. It was a lot of talking. I do some activities in between there to get people talking, but it is a lot of words. Another option, if you have found that you're doing a lot of talking at this point, that the audience seems a little bit kind of tired, they've sort of been sitting for a while, another idea that I've used is this. I have the letters roots, and they're on cards, and I stick them up all around the room. Now, if you have R-O-O-T-S all around the room, and you've just popped up this slide, here are the five areas that we teach in positive coaching on. We think that if you can have respect for all of these areas, you will have a really solid culture of respecting the rules, opponents, officials, teammates, and yourself. Let me ask you, can you think as a trainer, what would be a really clever thing to do with the audience to get them up and out of their seats and talking about each of these areas if you had a different area of the room they could go to under each one of these? Can you think of any ideas or how you would use it? And there's no right or wrong answer. It's just what, what, how, what would you think? Maybe um, people go to the letter where they have a good strategy for like building respect in that area. Mm -hmm. Good, that's a great idea. So just share what they what they've been doing well in that area and how well it works. Sure. Yep. What's another idea? Well, Kelly, I guess you could do the opposite, huh? You could mm -hmm. you could ask them which go to the area which is the biggest challenge for you as mm -hmm. as a coach, or or which is the biggest challenge for your team. Um, so it's, it's the opposite of Lin, uh, Lindsay's, but, but it accomplishes the same thing. I think it gets them to reflect about that aspect of roots. Absolutely. And what I really like about that, Ruben, too, is that you have people that all have kind of a problem, and they're getting together to solve it. So maybe you've got everybody in the room that's having, yeah, all these guys are really having trouble with officials, and they've self-identified that that's something they need to work on, and then they can talk through it together. So I, I love that idea, too. So it's just a different, a different way to approach it rather than going through each one. And then as you go around the room, you might have everybody talking about rules. And maybe you'll get one person to talk about, OK, so here's a challenge we have with the rules. And they might talk about you know, the, different, the different disrespect they have and how they've gotten over it. And then you can share your two cents. So it doesn't have to be everybody sitting in their seats. Get into five groups and come together. I didn't see that. That disappeared too quickly, Raul. Sorry. I didn't read what that just said. <laughs> Okay, um, just a different way to do it to get everybody a little bit more engaged. Now, what we talked about, again, back in trainer mode here. So these are the five areas, and the importance of what we've talked about all the way through this workshop is the importance of creating a culture so that whatever you decide as a coach is going to be your culture, you can uphold that. It actually makes your life easier. I always say that Positive Coaching Alliance takes out the gray areas, the debatable areas, because all of these roots of positive coaching are things that if you make it such a strong culture, it's not an issue. If you have um, a culture on your team where disrespecting officials is not tolerated, I don't care if it's the leading scorer or the bench sitter that is disrespecting the official, that player is not going to be playing. And if that's something that you've already clearly explained to the parents and the athletes and the coaches, then that won't be an issue for you. So we simply say culture is the way we do things here. It's a great sentence. It can be used in all different areas. And anytime you have an athlete or a parent or anyone challenge you in those areas, it's very simple to say, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, that's just not the way we do things here on this team. Now, one of the things that we do know is that we are human. And all of us, being coaches, we're passionate about what we do. And we love the passion that coaches have. So we like to, my mom used to always say, right before my brother would tease me, my older brother, she would say, Kelly, nip it in the bud. Know he's going to get you fired up. And just calm yourself down before he comes. Not that it always worked for my 13-year-old self, but as a coach, knowing ahead of time that a situation is going to get me fired up can get me to prepare. So one of the things, if you want to look at page 46, we have some tools that can help you in honoring the game, and one of them is called a self-control routine. Any of you that know there's going to be a fired up situation or that official shows up to the game that you know you've had trouble with before, um, you know, the one that probably should have worn their glasses when they usually don't have them on and is not, are not seeing what you're seeing, 
what are some things that you can do? One of the things I like to do is right here. I always have a water bottle with me constantly. And if I'm feeling like I'm going to blow my top, I just grumble into my water bottle. I always say this water bottle has heard some pretty negative stuff come out of my mouth. But my coaches, my other coaching staff and my players don't get to hear it. So it's a way for me to calm down. Is there anything that you do as a coach that you use as a strategy to calm yourself down when you're just ready to blow it? Does anybody want to share? I just turn around and walk the other way mm -hmm. and then just, and just take some breaths. And then actually last week I grabbed the water bottle. That's why I was starting to laugh. I grabbed the water bottle, but next thing you know, I had water on the court. So I'm <laughs> out there wiping the floor while they're yeah. on the other side. But anyway, yeah, that <laughs> water it does. It does work. Um, clicking on the chat balloon on the left. You want us to click on the chat balloon on the left? Blue, yep. Okay. Let me see. Oh, are you sending messages all along here? Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Trying to figure chat controls out. Okay, got it. We can all see it now. All right. I think we can see what you're saying now. Okay, well, one of the things we talk about is counting backwards from 100 or breathing, deep breaths, whatever it takes. Sometimes just an assistant coach knowing you well enough to know that you're going to flip out, an assistant coach saying, okay, you know what, Kelly, I know this is going to be tough. That call was tough. You need to, you need to calm it down a little bit. Um, so we, uh, we recognize that you're human, and so we give you some strategies to deal with that. But bottom line is, for a lot of these tools that you can take with you, is use these as teachable moments. One of the things that we find sticks with people when they leave this workshop is the video of the Mallory moment because it is something that sort of goes against the culture. It goes against the entertainment sports culture where winning is the number one, not winning is the goal. These two girls really got to see the big picture and they, they did something that went against what everybody else thought they would do because this is not a winning, win at all cost culture. Were they competitive? Yes. Were they trying to win? Yes. But they saw that she deserved something she didn't get. So we call this the Mallory moment, and at many, many times throughout a game or a season, you're going to have a lot of small moments that, have, that will happen, and you as a coach are going to be challenged with your decisions that you make, and your teammates are going to be challenged, and your players are going to be challenged. So along the way, there's a lot of Mallory moments. I'm going to read for you a quote from Jim Thompson, our founder, um, about this Mallory moment. And this, again, this is in the notes at the bottom of the screen. I usually have it written on an index card. I don't necessarily read it at every workshop that I do, but for your sake, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it just so you can really hear what it says. Um, this is from Jim Thompson. If you coach long enough, you will find yourself faced with your own big Mallory moment opportunity, maybe more than once. But for sure, coaching provides a never-ending sequence of smaller Mallory moments. My challenge to you is by your actions time and again in those moments to elevate your game the way Mallory Holtman did. So we're asking that you take the time to make elevate your game just the way Mallory did. And think about this example as you come up with those challenges. Um, all right, Raul, I looked up the Mallory story on Wikipedia, and it seems that the umpire was mistaken in his call. I've used it to emphasize how officials' mistakes provide awesome opportunities for athletes to show their best. Interesting, interesting. So the official, so then it wouldn't have been a single. Is that the bottom line? Right. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't realize that. All right. So to wrap it up here, here are the three principles that we talked about. Now, one of the things I like to do when I get to this screen is do a little review. I was an elementary teacher. I like to check for understanding here. So we talked about these three principles today, the Elm Tree of Mastery. Who can tell me one thing that you would take away from the Elm Tree of Mastery? What's something you remember? And every time I ask this to a crowd, somebody will say, flush it, flush mistakes, or effort goals, or learning instead of mistakes. They always, they always remember that. Remember the goal, and then I repeat the goal. The goal of the Elm Tree of Mastery is to get the best performance out of your athletes. How about filling the emotional tank? What was the takeaway from there? Who remembers something? And people a lot of times will say, five to one ratio, or you know, gas tank of a car, and fill tanks rather than drain them, and high fives, and smiles, and nonverbals are all the things that people shout out. Yeah, and the goal of filling the emotional tank was, when I put that out there, sometimes I get answers, sometimes people are like, just to make the players feel good, to play better. Yes, the goal of filling emotional tanks is to make the players able to hear what you have to say, make them more coachable and perform better. And the last one is honoring the game. What were some takeaways from honoring the game? And they say, roots, 
respect for officials, respect for teammates um, are a lot of the answers that I get. And honoring the game, the goal of honoring the game is having the kids see that the game is bigger than themselves. It's bigger than at the moment. And seeing the big picture are the lessons that are going to stick with them long beyond when the whistle blows. So I like to use that slide there to kind of wrap it up, the workshop, and see how everybody um, they did with their comprehension and just to solidify the goals for everyone because it's a lot of information. It can be information overload at the end of a long night. Now, before I go on, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to explain a little bit about the scenario menu. But before I do that, does anyone have any questions on honoring the game before we move on? Questions, ideas, things you liked, didn't like? Okay. You guys are so quiet tonight. All right. Um, so this is what's next. Now, at this point in the workshop, I usually like to get my timing so that I have at least 20 minutes at the end of the workshop to work on the scenario menu. Now, that is going to take time to work on your um, delivery of your workshop and the timing of your workshop so that you do have about 20 minutes left. Now, this will be in your typical 90-minute workshop. Um, this scenario menu is a fantastic way to get the audience engaged because all along you've been giving them theories and research, some examples, but this is where they can really put the research into practice and put what you've taught them and make it real for them. So if you look at this menu, um, and it is something that you will have to use your mouse to click through, but these are all hyperlinked. So each one of these is just a title of a scenario that can possibly happen for coaches. And they're broken up into elm tree scenarios, emotional tank scenarios, and honoring the game scenarios. My suggestion to you is to go through each one of them individually on your own and just pull out ones that you really like and you really connect with. At least two. I'd love it if you'd memorize all of them, but at least in the beginning to have two that you feel very comfortable with explaining the scenario and explaining the tools. Um, but it's also important when you call the partner three days before the workshop to ask them what are their challenges, what are their concerns. And sometimes you can tailor the way you use the scenario based on that. Um, a lot of times, very commonly, I will get um, questions about you know, varying abilities. I have a team of kids, because a lot of it's rec league. Some of the kids are really good. Some of the kids are really struggling, and it's tough for the coaches to bring all that together. Um, I also got a lot of questions about parenting their own child. So that's another scenario that's here. It's just helpful for you to know what these titles, what scenario that it goes to, um, instead of just opening up the scenario and going, hmm, does anybody see one they think might be good to talk about? So um, I said, you know, two in each one. No, three is even better. Six is even better. But at least in the beginning, have two that you feel comfortable with. So let me just explain how this works. Um, varying abilities, or big game nerves. Let's take that one. So let's click on this and see. Here's a scenario. And you can have somebody from the audience read it, or you can read it. Here's a scenario. All week long, you've had trouble getting your athletes to focus. You think they're nervous about their upcoming competition against a powerful, undefeated team. You have a few minutes with your athletes before the competition starts to get them ready to compete. As a double goal coach, what do you say? Now, this is a fun one. I've had coaches huddle up and get into huddles and practice. What's your speech? What's your pregame speech? Um, there's a lot of different ways you can integrate people to get into groups. Um, and we've talked about some of those ways so far. You can have them get together by age or by sport. You can be really out there. And another activity that we can do is have them pantomime. Just act out the sport that you coach and find everybody else that looks like they're playing baseball or soccer and get into groups according to that. You can call it a number. When I call it a number, I want you to get into groups of six or get in groups of five or and just have it be mass chaos if you want to until they get into groups. Or you can say, turn to a partner and I'd like you to talk about how you would handle this scenario and what do you do. Give your best coaching speech to your partner. So then you can have a few share depending on the time. The first screen is always a scenario. The second screen are takeaways. These are the tools that I promised I would give you to use with your team. So, um, on, and they can always follow along. The red box always has the pages in the book that correspond to it. So you can go over it. Make sure that you understand these. That's why in the questions for this course, I always say, find two, give me an example of two tools and how to use them specifically so that you can pull them out of your pocket and you can really explain them well. Emphasizing Elm, reminding of preparation, nervous is normal, and, and go into a little bit more detail. You know, you don't have to just read them down the list because they can read, but give a little bit more detail. I'm going quickly because we're running out of time here. But now, each menu at the very bottom corner, if you can see this, there's a, a little home and there's an arrow. So to go back to that menu, the scenario menu, you click on home and it brings you right back to this. So then you can do another scenario. Maybe now we're going to talk about one from emotional tank. 
So here's one. You attended a PCA workshop, but you find it really hard to achieve. Your, parent, your players need a lot of correction. How do you handle this? So here's another one. The cool thing about this one, which I like to do, is there's a video of one of our trainers, Steve Henderson, modeling how to do positive charting. So I love this one because it's an extra little video in there. Buddy system, two-minute drill, positive charting, and then let me show you an example of how positive charting works. Here's our very own Steve Henderson working with a football team. So that's a cool one. Um, all right, when you get to, maybe you've done two and three scenarios, and you're finished, your time is up, maybe you've picked one from each, you can click on this little arrow, and this brings you to Herm Edwards, which is a video that talks about, that I, I can show this, this is pretty short. When the book of your life is written, what will it look like? Well, let's say you made a difference, uh, and you really want to make a difference. You have the ability, with young people in mind, that through sports, they learn a lot about life. How you handle these young players, I think, is very, very important in their growth. Uh, most of these players will not go on to be professionals, but the opportunity they have in, in, in sports is really a part of their life. Learn how to compete. That's probably the most important thing. And I think the way you compete is important, and you have to understand, someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. But at the end, how do you handle that situation is probably the most important thing if you're going to have a successful life. And that's how we wrap up our workshop with Herm Edwards. Mm -hmm. And the next slide says, when the book of your life is written, will it say that you made a difference? If you remember in the beginning of the workshop, I asked you all to write down how you want to be remembered as a coach on the front cover of your book. I'd like you to open that up right now and take a minute and think if you want to add anything to that. Or do you want to change your answer after hearing what you've heard today? And it's really cool for me because I see a lot of people, they do. They change things. They write things down. They add things to how they want to be remembered as a coach, which is really, really cool for me because it shows that there was an impact. There was a little bit of a change, and they might use some terminology. Um, so this is where, you know, it all comes full circle. And then how do you want to be remembered? Again, that's, that's just the slide that pops up. What are two or three things from this workshop that help make that happen? Sometimes what I'll have them do is just I want you to turn to a partner and tell me two things that you're going to walk out of here and try to implement with your team next time you see them out on the field. And, and they never have trouble coming up with these things. Oh, you know, flush, I can do that. Effort goals, I can try to do that. Whatever it is. Um, buddy system, that's something we already do. So it's just a really neat way to solidify all the theory that we've talked about and put it into um, something they can walk away with. And a lot of times when you see the evaluations at the end, actually talking about evaluations, um, text to sign in is a slide that I've copied and put at the end of the workshop too. Because on the app, when people have signed in, I can look at my app on my phone and see that only 12 people have signed in and there's 30 people in the room. So at this point, I might say, okay, guys, I need you to do me a favor. I know some of you may have come in late. If you could please text to this number and sign in with the workshop number, your name and email, so you can get credit for being here. And unfortunately, I only have 12 sign-ins and there's 30 of you here. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll say, okay, uh, Mike, yeah, you're not signed in yet. I'll just make up the name Mike. And somebody in the room is always named Mike, and they're like, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. So they all crack up. So, Mike, sorry, we can't leave till you all sign in. So can you please sign in for us? Um, then, date your card and complete your evaluation. These are little tiny details, but they're really important. Um, every coach, when they come to a Positive Coaching Alliance workshop, they get to leave with a card. We have a card that we give them saying you're now double goal coach certified, and they can put the date on it, and there's a quote by Phil Jackson on the back. So this is a card to say that they were certified. They can keep it in their wallet. Um, and then the other one is the evaluation. And I ask everybody at this point to open up to the last page of your book, page 71. And if you could carefully tear out the workshop evaluation, my name is Kelly Kratz, and I have them put that at the top. I really try, we really try to improve our workshops based on feedback that we get. And over the last 15 years, our workshops have really changed a lot based on what you've told us that you've wanted to hear more of and wanted to see. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to fill out that evaluation so that we can have an idea on how we're doing and what you liked about the workshop and what you like, might want to see improvement in. There's also some great ways you can be connected. Our website, positivecoach.org, has a ton of resources on it, but even more hot off the presses. And this is the next slide that, for me, the Development Zone website, it's not showing up, but there's a, whole, there's a screenshot of the Development Zone website. Um, this is fantastic. The Development Zone website is kind of the WebMD for coaches. It's a great resource for you as a coach to type in a question that you have on any topic in sports, any subject, and resources will be right there at your fingertips. Some are videos, some are interviews with PCA people, some are interviews with famous coaches and athletes, but it's a great way for you to get your problem solved instantly, and as of August 1st, it's gonna be mobile friendly. So you'll be able to sit there right on the sidelines if you have a player crying that you can't get motivated, and you type in crying players, boom, tons of resources will come up to help you. So it's a fantastic, fantastic resource for you. There's over a 1,000 resources on it now, 
and they're trying to add to that every single day. Um, Katie Saylor, incidentally, that's on this in this course with us. This is her job. This is her baby. So she's her job is to find resources for the development zone. So someday you may be asked to give one, which is a great thing too. And then if you're on Facebook and Twitter, um, actually we have Instagram, and we actually are starting a Pinterest account now for PCA. Um, please follow us and uh, spread the word of Positive Coaching Alliance. So that's the end. To wrap it up, thank you for your commitment. I really appreciate you being here tonight. If you have any questions, I will be here. Um, but thank you very much, coaches. I really appreciate what you're doing, and keep doing it. So that's the workshop in a quick nutshell. Um, that's how we wrap it up pretty quickly. I recommend that the first couple times you do it, take a little more time than you need to because I've gotten stuck in the very beginning and like you, you get to Herm Edwards and you're like, oh my gosh, I have one minute left. And it's really important to wrap up a workshop well, not just go, oh my gosh, then there's this, how do you want to be remembered? Okay, okay, sign in, okay, do the evaluation. You know, it's just rushing people out the door. So just be aware that when you get to finish the honor of the game, you're not quite done yet. You still have about five to ten minutes left of information to give them just to wrap it up so they're not just shoving them out the door. Um, but that's pretty much the workshop in a nutshell. Questions? <laughs> I have a question about yeah. the PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's just how, like, it might be a te too technical of a question, but when I click on the different scenarios, it doesn't take me anywhere. Is that happening to anyone else? Uh, I don't, is it a Mac or a PC? Uh, it's a Mac. Okay. Uh, we can we can work out technical issues. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. It's it's a good question. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a good question. It should automatically hyperlink to where it's going. So if it doesn't, we'll have to figure out maybe it's the way it downloaded or something. But they all should be should be hyperlinked. So before you would um, present a workshop, we'd make sure you have that. <laughs> you have that all ironed out. But thanks for I'll look, we'll look into that. Any other questions? Comments? Okay, well let me tell you, if you guys don't mind me stealing about three more minutes, I just want to explain where we're headed from here. Um, you guys are now finished with the content of the course. The, two, the last two questions for the week aren't due until Monday, but you guys are done. So the next week for you, which is the third through the seventh, is a week for you to prepare to give your own presentation. Um, the final exam for this course is for you to present 20 minutes of any of the principles that you'd like to. Now let me kind of explain how that works. Um, what I ask you to do is do a five-minute introduction to yourself. We want to know who you are and what brought you to PCA. So it doesn't mean the introduction to the workshop necessarily where you talk about, you know, Positive Coaching Alliance has been around since 1998 and it has this many chapters. I want to hear your personal intro. What would you do when you're introduced into a workshop? Workshop. 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 Three minutes. doesn't have to be five. But just to give you a guideline, then you can choose your favorite principle that you want to illustrate. So you'll have about 15 minutes to do either Elm Tree of Mastery, filling the emotional tank, or honoring the game. Um, I have had one person that decided to do his 15 minutes on the scenario menu, which he did it pretty well, but I would suggest illustrating one of the principles instead. Um, and we get to watch you present. Now, I know it's kind of goofy because we're on a Google Hangout. It's not quite as good as if we had a live audience, but it's really actually a pretty accurate way for us to see some of your personality coming through, some of your questioning style, um, how you handle questions from the audience. Um, so what I do want you to do is make it as realistic as possible. Instead of you saying, okay, now I would ask the audience to um, turn to a partner and ask them this. I want you to ask us the real question because one of the skills of being a, a good presenter is being able to field questions. And a lot of times when Ruben and I and Eric are on these Hangouts as an audience, we give you responses that we've actually gotten from audience members. We're not trying to trip you up or challenge you or test you, but you know, if you ask us a question, we're going to give you answers that we've heard from other people, and it's good to see how you can handle answering and asking questions, and also so that you can see that asking questions actually takes time. If you skip over the whole like question part, sometimes people don't realize that just asking two or three people a question and getting that answer back, that takes like three or four minutes to do. So if you only have 15 minutes for each principle, you've got to keep it, you know, it's good to, to practice with pace. So it's an even playing field because everybody's doing it on a Hangout. So it's the same amount of awkwardness for everyone. Um, what I'm going to do is send you a, um, a link, and actually an email, I'll probably send it tomorrow morning. And this email is going to have a link to a Google Drive, which you guys all are, already have Google Drive. It's a spreadsheet that we've set up where you can fill in a time slot if you'd like to practice on a Google Hangout before you do the final which we do encourage you to do. It is optional, you don't have to do it, but if you'd like to do a run-through, 
Um, Ruben has offered to do that next week. I'm going to be available next week by phone or email, but not by Wi-Fi. I'm going to be in an area that has awful Wi-Fi. I already tested it out. So if you have any questions for me or want to go over anything with me, you just have to call me or send me an email. But Ruben has offered to do the Google Hangouts for practice next week. So I'm going to send you a link to a sheet that has time slots that he's offered to be available for people to do that. And then I'm also going to send you the link to a few, and I've, I've already asked for permission for this, people in previous courses that I think have done a really great job at their mock, um, mock workshop hangout. Um, I've, I'm going to send you the link so you can watch some of those just to see kind of how they do it um, as an example. So that's going to be next week, which is the 3rd through the 7th. The next week after that, which will be the 10th, actually for two weeks, you've got like 20 some people in this course, so it's going to take two weeks to go through the final um, presentations, but the week of the 10th through the 14th and the 17th through the 21st um, is going to be your chance to do the final. So what I'm going to do is split your group up into, I might even just do it randomly and say half of you have to go the week of the 10th through the 14th and the other half to go the 17th through the 21st, and you're going to have the same thing. You're going to have 20 minutes, five minutes for an intro, and then 15 minutes for your principal of choice, and myself and Ruben and or Eric Eisendrath will be on the call and we're going to give you some feedback and evaluate you and decide if we feel you're ready to go out in front of a live audience. Um, sometimes we feel that the live audience is better if we have like a fake PCA audience in a local chapter office so you can just do it in front of live people. Um, other times we'll say, okay, you know what, you seem <laughs> perfectly ready to go. We'll match you up with a veteran trainer and you would be presenting to a live workshop of coaches but you would just present one principle at first. We wouldn't have you throw out there and just do a whole workshop right off the bat. So you might just do honoring the game or you might just do filling the emotional tanks. And then if that trainer feels that you've done a great job there and feels you can handle it on your own, the next step is for you to present a workshop in its entirety all by yourself. But we do usually have a mentor trainer there with you just for backup. Um, you would be presenting the whole thing from beginning to end for a live audience. But we do, as I said, we do have that person there for support the first time out. And then after that, you're on your own. So that's sort of the perfect world scenario on how we certify trainers. Do you guys have any questions on that? Questions, comments, concerns? I got one. Yes. Is, um, I guess as far as the presentation go or, or the mock, um, like I said, I, that's probably my weakest, weakest probably area or I'm just kind of unsure. But I've been watching, the, the, uh, the uh, I guess, some of the mocks that you've had. Mm -hmm. and, there, it seems like everybody's really different. I don't, I'm not seeing mm -hmm. one identical to the other, and so mm -hmm. I think one of the things is 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 being able to maybe identify with one of those, and, and not saying copy them, but because you know, like you talk really really fast, and you notice that I talk really really slow, <laughs> so you know I might have to skip some areas in, in that. I mean, I, I I think I heard you talking about. That you know, it's okay to skip, but make sure that you hit those points. Mm -hmm. Is yeah, that I mean, it's just yeah, you just have to make it your own. Um, and I talk, I talk fast, but I probably take more time than others to do group activities. So I need to pick up the pace in some areas because I like to do the group activities. Other people, I mean, as as Rachel said, it's you've got to make it your own. You've got to do what's comfortable for you. There have been some trainers that I have seen that talk half as slow as I do, but are twice as effective as I am in explaining some of the principles just because of the way they do it and the examples they use and the stories they use. So, um, you know, you can watch, you can just, I, did you just search, I guess you just do a Google search of the mock workshops? Yeah, you can find them all, you can find them all that way. I was going to send you some links to some, some better ones than others because I don't want you watching some that I, that we uh, didn't give a great evaluation on, but, um, but it's a good, it's a good thing just to see and as you said, everybody's different. Every workshop is different. We watched 47 trainers this week, and I don't think any two of them are the same. But the consistency of the message was the same. The principles were the same. Um, and, the, and the passion that they have for our cause is the same. So, but yeah, we want, we, were, we want to see your personality come out. Now, Raul asked workshops in Spanish. Um, if you would like to do it in Spanish, that is your choice. Um, Ruben can actually understand Spanish which I can pretty much talk to a four-year-old in Spanish. That's what I have been complimentary told, that I, I can pretty much talk to a four-year-old. So, um, but I had a, I had a, we had a presenter who was from Tampa Bay, and his first language was Spanish, and we were not giving him a great evaluation when he was doing it in English. He was really struggling, and Ruben said, um, 
could you, could you do it in Spanish for us? Just the intro. And he did the intro in Spanish, and it was wonderful. He was animated. He was he was talking. It was exciting. So you know, if if English is a struggle for you, then obviously we want you to do it in your native language. So um, however you're however you're comfortable with that is fine with me too. All right, are we good? All right, so then I will uh, I'll be in touch with you guys via email, and uh, I'll put it, also put it on the group email, the group wall post, in case you want to see it there too. So it's not the same thing coming at you twice. I just want to make sure I'm covering all my bases. But as I said, I'm reachable by phone or email. Anything you guys need, just please let me know. But um, take advantage of the practice if you have it. So, all right, enjoy. Yeah, Raul, sorry I missed you too. <laughs> all right, take care, guys. Good night.